Timothy Dalton, the best Bond in my opinion. The two films he starred in are the ones I remember most vividly. Sure, they're a little ridiculous in places. I mean, just shoot him in the body. But they realigned the franchise with its roots, portraying a more serious and ruthless Bond, akin to what you'd find in Ian Fleming's novels. It's a shame that he decided to opt out of further movies after legal issues between MGM and E.ON, but I suppose Pierce Brosnan was pretty good. Of course, Bond films aren't all about the actors. In The Living Daylights, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage is the standout machine, complete with fitted skis, naturally. This is the Aston Martin of the film's release year, 1987, but there was an additional component to this film, an entirely new backstory. But it didn't actually arrive until three years later, 1990. And its orchestrator? Well, it was Amstrad, of course, when they created the ZX Spectrum James Bond 007 action pack, having bought the Sinclair brand five years earlier. Right, pay attention, Bond. This is the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus 2. It's a fully operational computer with 128K memory, but it comes with three James Bond games and a light gun that fires armor-piercing shells. Now that's your assignment. No, no, don't sit in that chair! Sorry, Bond. Haven't perfected that yet. The Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus 2. Now, regardless of your feelings towards this soul-blistering advert, rolling out just in time for the festive season, it certainly piqued the interests of many a youngster, rolling into this brand new decade. Here was a ZX Spectrum Plus 2 with a light gun, and an entire action pack based around James Bond, which you might just be able to snag for Christmas if your family was rich enough. Of course, this may not have been the peak for the ZX Spectrum. Here was a machine that, at its core, was now 80 years old. It wasn't even the peak for James Bond. Many hadn't yet become accustomed to Dalton's rendition of Fleming's most famous character, but Amstrad weren't messing about. This was a serious pack, and they aimed it at the kids just getting hooked on this fleeting but new 007 chapter. And it certainly worked, helping to drag the Spectrum into the 90s, and that's partly due to how well this kit is put together. You might think that Amstrad would have chosen to focus on and use the artwork from 1989's License to Kill rather than The Living Daylights, but for most kids, their first taste of Dalton's Bond would be through video rental, even TV premieres, and back then the industry moved slowly, so The Living Daylights was likely much more familiar to its target audience. I'm sure it also had some cost saving from Amstrad's perspective as well, but I also think the main reason is due to the games, and we'll get to them later. This is very firmly a UK release pack, and of course it is. It's for Spectrum's home soil, where it sold best. It may have made it into some other European regions, but it's here where it made its money. Inside, of course, we get a ZX Spectrum Plus 2A. This is a darker revision over the original grey Plus 2 and based around the Plus 3 internals. Amstrad even include a note to make you aware of the hardware differences. We get a standard instruction manual, but it's for James Bond's specific components that I find the most fascinating. First up is the Magnum Light Phaser, rebranded as a Sinclair Phaser. Sure, this might not be Bond specific, but it fits well. I mean, what self-respecting spy doesn't have a huge plastic gun? Inside this envelope, marked top secret, we find an official looking letter and a passport. Come on, can you imagine the excitement getting this as an eight year old? Or even as an adult, I know that impotent blue passports appeal to some. 
Handily, this official document also acts as the game instructions, but carries through the aesthetic to make it feel like an essential prop rather than just a scrappy leaflet. You can even fill in your details if you choose. We've also got some warranty information, oh and the original receipt for the pack, £159.99, bargain. And here we have two cassette tapes. The first contains two games, Lord Bromley's Estate on Side A and Q's Shooting Range on Side B. The second cassette contains a game called Mission Zero on Side A and a special audio recording on Side B. But actually this is our first port of call. Grabbing a suitable cassette player, our first task is to listen to the audio tape. Ah, there you are, 007. Yep, that is indeed Desmond Llewellyn, or Q if you prefer, which certainly gives this whole thing more impetus. This is also where we get fed the first part of our new backstory. I'm sorry, 007, but you weren't invited just to enjoy the country air. Now, 002 has reported strange happenings along the Turkish coast. About a week ago, a tiny little fishing village was swamped by foreigners. They're a mixed bunch, all nationalities, but they knew each other. And he heard them talking about low-level helicopter flying. Also, Q is actually saying broccoli rather than Bromley, which appears to be a nod to the film's producers, Albert and Barbara Broccoli. Why it was changed in the game is unclear. Broccoli is playing host to some of the most important people in Europe, and we can't take any chances. So 002 is dead, but he reported lots of movement in a tiny fishing village on the Turkish coast, along with discussions of low-level helicopter flying. But regardless, we're going to hang around on Lord Bromley's estate and shoot some clay pigeons, because, well, f**k it. Now, this game is published by Domark Limited, who are known as Square Enix today, but programmed by a little outfit known as Divide by Zero. We get a little introduction, and we're informed that an organisation known as Spectre have other ideas, whatever they are. We're then straight into the shooting. Now, you can get an idea how the light sensor is working here by the significant screen disruption occurring when you press the trigger. The back of the passport tells us it's to help establish our aim, but what's happening is similar to most light gun games of the era, although this one employs a kind of double buffer approach, presumably to increase accuracy. When you press the trigger, the game works out approximately where you're aiming based on the timings of the CRT scan rate. It then throws a block across the x-axis and edges white light into the area it thinks you're pointing. As soon as the gun senses this light, it repeats this part of the process for verification and registers your shot. If this happens to also coincide with a target hitbox, well then the clay pigeon is destroyed, otherwise you've missed. With this in mind, we need to progress through 10 levels of increasing difficulty, and if we succeed, then Spectre appears in their chopper, in front of a ready cocked shotgun no less. Good work lads, shoot them 10 times and we're good. It's actually a pretty simple but decent light gun game, which seems to borrow location elements from the estate shown in the living daylights. Anyway, it's time to go back to the audio cassette. Ah, oh, 007. Thanks for getting down here so quickly. You know, we were right. The crew of the chopper reads like a roll call of international terrorists. Four of the most dangerous mercenaries on our files. 
So we've got more details on that chopper, and then Q has some light humorous banter before explaining about the organization's spider, which if you remember was Spectre in the game. Perhaps they wanted to differentiate from the actual organization in Ian Fleming's books and avoid potential legal issues, I don't know. But we get our first whiff that this storyline may not be accepted as canon, or it's very branching at least. Now, there's only one organization powerful enough to recruit terrorists of these capabilities. An organization called Spider. If they'd killed those ambassadors on British soil, think what it would have meant to the peace talks next month. Well, we'd have been back on the iciest depths of the Cold War. So, we're sending you in. Then we're onto the weapon, Q's speciality, and we actually get a bit of tech borrowed from License to Kill, clearly trying to increase the wonder surrounding this pack and the included phaser. Now, this may look like an ordinary pistol, but it's not. Firstly, it's electrogenetically personalised. Only you'll be able to use it. Now, I want you to hold it while I set it. There. That's it. Pay attention, because this is actually three weapons in one. For your second visit to the range, you'll use it in continuous fire mode. And finally, the heavy artillery. Well, you can't really lug a bazooka around with you, so we've devised a miniature explosive shell. This is Q's shooting range, or Q's armoury, depending on which title you get in the game and on the cassette. Here there are only three levels, where we get used to each of the ammunition types and have to achieve an increasingly accurate hit rate. I actually thought it was a recoded version of the firing range from the Magnum Phaser game Bronx Street Cop, but despite the similarities, it is not. Strangely, targeting and accuracy is a bit more difficult than Bromley's Manor, which is strange as they both use the same system, but the shortness of the title means we can swiftly move on. The last message gets to the real guts of the situation. Well done, 007. I knew you could do it. Yeah, no problems whatsoever, mate. While you've been on the firing range, we've uncovered what Spider is really up to. They're going to mount an all-out attack on the Peace Talks next month. In the confusion that follows, they'll seize military power in three of the world's most unstable countries. They'll hold the East and the West to ransom. Overnight, they'll turn from being a counter-espionage organization to a major political power. Pretty heavy stuff. Fortunately, we've located their headquarters. You must infiltrate their base swiftly and silently, shooting anybody who gets in your way before they have a chance to raise the alarm. So, like most Bond games, the task is to kill every damn person. But our sources say there are eight levels before you come face to face with their leader in his inner sanctum. You must use whichever of the gun's modes is most suitable for each situation. Take note of that part, because it's an excellent example of wedging this whole backstory into a pre-written game. Right, now your mission briefing is waiting. Read it carefully, but don't waste time. This is the point where we're also directed to read the accompanying briefing. It says, Your holiday on Lord Bromley's estate is over. Report immediately to Q's underground shooting range in Brentwood where you will undergo a crash training course in three new weapons. Q will judge your performance and he is instructed by the PM and myself to keep you there until you have reached the required level of competence. Then report to my office for instructions on Mission Zero, M. So really we should have been told to read that in the last section. You know, it's very complicated keeping up with the order of all these accessories, especially when the instructions are out of sync. It seems there was a lot of miscommunication when putting this pack together. Anyway, let's dive into Mission Zero. 
Now, it might be called Mission Zero everywhere else, but in the game it's very clearly just the living daylights, but with a couple of tweaks. The original game wasn't light gun ready, you just had to be quick with the cursor. However, this Mission Zero revision is converted for light gun use. It's also likely another reason the Living Daylights was used rather than License to Kill. Domark had already made a License to Kill game and it couldn't really be adapted for the light gun, although they did steal the musical riffs from License to Kill for the audio tape. Whereas here we have a game which only needed a few tweaks and we're good to go. It's also very loose on story. Bond steams through all the levels as we fire at will. I mean, they're all levels which represent a part of the film, The Living Daylights, but they could just about represent the journey through our new storyline, if you squint a bit, perhaps. Using space to move Bond onwards, we're just gunning through, taking down bosses on each level, before we take out the big military honcho at the end who must now be playing the role of Spider's leader. Although to be fair, running and gunning through a fun fair does take a bit of explaining. But those aren't the only shoehorned inconsistencies. On the first level, we're using a paintball gun. Pretty sure our training didn't prepare us for that. Then on the theater level, this chap, who is clearly supposed to be Koskov, the Russian defecting agent from The Living Daylights decides to run along us, despite Q distinctly telling us this was a solo mission. Then we have the item choice before each new level. Remember Q telling us to choose the correct gun mode each time? Well, apparently these symbols relate to the gun mode. Or they do now, at least. Pick the wrong one and your progression through the level will be hampered significantly. It's trial and error, so nothing irritating about that whatsoever. It doesn't help that although the item seems to relate to the level, for instance you need the binoculars for the theatre, you don't get told what level you're entering until after picking up the item. Once you're in the level, shooting the 007 symbol will activate your selection. Useful, say, for the helicopter that pops up. You know, Spider's preferred method of transport. Oh, come on, I was right at the end. In The Living Daylights, it's used as the escape vehicle for Kotzkov, but in this reality, it's just another foe to dispose of. You can see they tried their best to knit things together. Overall, this isn't a terrible game, but it's odd. The first four levels or so, you can sometimes just get away with holding space and pelting through, which is good because targeting accuracy is way off, probably due to fudging it into a game that wasn't designed for it. Sometimes it's fun to play, other times it's just plain annoying. But you've got to commend them for selecting a game which a light gun and completely alternative story can just be wedged in. It still kind of works. There are no continues, so lose your lives and you're dead. But if you do manage to complete the game, then, well, you get exactly the same ending as The Living Daylights. Of course you do, including the title splashed up the top. It's clear that this was done as cheaply and quickly as possible. I imagine they spent all their money on Desmond Llewellyn. It's a shame because, other inconsistencies aside, it lets the whole bundle down. But we have Mission Zero, the culmination of our completely new storyline about Spider wanting to disrupt peace talks and then taking control of the unstable countries. But Bond has dealt with it once again. Hurrah! Apart from the in-game consistencies, I actually quite like this new storyline devised by Amstrad. The original Living Daylights was actually quite complicated for a Bond film. In the film, it's actually 004 that bites the dust in the training exercise at the start, supposedly by the KGB, so then Bond helps a defecting KGB officer, Koskov, 
who turns out to not actually be defecting, having found out from his apparent girlfriend, who then helps Bond find him, and also an arms dealer who Koskov was setting up with the KGB to sell arms to, but not before he bought opium off the Mujahideen to make profit with the funds from the arms sales, just after Bond pretends to shoot General Pushkin of the KGB, who then fires Koskov, who incidentally should be dead after exploding in a fireball, and just after Bond kills Whittaker, who is the arms dealer. <sighs> also, the only reason the film is called The Living Daylights was down to this single line. Whoever she was must have scared the living daylights out of her. So that's irrelevant from the go. You can see why they went with the new storyline anyway. For the children, and also people like me, who like their James Bond stories to be simple and easy to digest. Have you ever wanted to get into animation? Well, thanks to this video's sponsor, Skillshare, you can do just that. Fraser Davidson has an excellent course that will allow you to create a walking and gunning Bond in no time at all. Or maybe you want to dive into filmmaking, well, just pick up Penny Lane's course on turning found footage into a compelling video. I use Skillshare myself and there's a wealth to get stuck into. Right now, Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box to help you explore your creativity. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. Of course, this isn't the only James Bond set of games on the ZX Spectrum. In fact, most of these pre-Dalton games actually appeared at the end of the 80s and even early 90s. They're mostly your typical run and gun, with the exception of the unofficial Octopussy, which is very much an adventure game and a departure for James Bond games in general. It's also incredibly rare, so if you happen to have it, take good care of it. If you wanted some more Dalton action, you could always get a Master System or Mega Drive and play Domark's 1993 entry, The Duel. But what makes the Spectrum Action Pack stand out for me is how well it played into the imagination of these 8-bit titles. Back then, we may not have had the graphics to produce huge, lush worlds, but we had cover art, we had backstories, and on the rare occasion, we even had props to bring the whole experience to life. That's exactly what the 007 Action Pack does, and even though it's a bit sloppy in places, it's still a winner because of it. Anyway, I find this a fascinating bit of both Bond and Sinclair history, and so wanted to share the, the whole experience with you. I hope you enjoyed it, thanks for watching, and have a great evening. <laughs>